right? It looks really bad. Um, so, uh, but, but what you need to know, I guess everybody knows this at some point, but doesn't, doesn't realize what implications that has for the fabrication process, is that your typical, uh, your typical chip consists of multiple layers. And so the production process involves making each layer individually. So your typical microprocessor will go through uh, typically like, like a thousand production steps um, and that might take something like six weeks. So a modern microprocessor takes six weeks a year. Um, and so this is a complicated process um, and it's maybe especially complicated because through these multiple layers you're doing the same thing over and over and that means that a single chip goes through the same kind of machine over and over. And so what typically happens is these machines are so expensive that your manufacturer will not just will not be able to just line them up in a row and have your chip go through a sequence of them. But instead there will be a complex trajectory that your chip takes through the fab. Um, and so it's it's just determining that sequence. What machines your chip goes through as it's being made is complicated. And it gets further complicated by the physical layout of modern fabs. So uh, big fabs and big modern microprocessors even have multiple buildings, they have multiple they have complex transport systems, um, and uh, there's all kinds of other complications. Uh, and I'll talk about some of them, some, some more of them later. Um, also, the tools themselves are something that you have to take into account. So it's not like uh, it's not like a tool that always will sort of do the same thing every time. Uh, Sometimes you have what's called a single lot, single chamber tool, which will, uh, which will do something fairly simple. But in many cases, you will have a piece of equipment where you can put multiple chips in. Sometimes these multiple chips, you all put them on, at, you put them in at once, and then you put another batch of chips in. Sometimes you will um, you open up to a simulation bar. Um, sometimes you have equipment like this, uh, where you have cascades of things going through, where you have like chemical mass. Uh, we can put multiple things in and you can put them in at different times as long as you remember to take them out again at the right time. Uh, and then ultimately you have cluster tools which are several tools that are grouped into a single tool. So it's like a little fab um, all by itself. And you might, have, um, you might have scheduling going on inside the cluster tool even though it's also you treat it as a single tool and you're scheduling on the entire fab. Um, as I said, don't, don't worry about the details on these slides. Just realize that um, uh, just realize that these these machines themselves have complex behavior, uh, and some of these machines are very expensive. So modern lithography equipment, you might have a single machine in your fab that costs like 100 million euros. Um, um, so um, it's it's kind of important that you run this efficiently. It's the most complicated machine in the world, pretty much, in many ways. Um, and it costs, a typical big fab costs, you know, might cost tens of millions of dollars to run every single day. Uh, so it might make a big difference on how efficient your production process is. Um, but unfortunately it's very complicated, it's very, uh, very difficult to get a handle on this. So for example, um, so, so I, I showed you the tool side of this. Uh, the other side is that your modern that will not just make a single product, but it will make many different products. And each product will have a different sequence of production steps uh, that it goes through in the fab. And so you will have somewhere you will have an IT system that manages what's called a route, which describes what needs to be done to that particular chip as it goes through the fab. Um, and each step that it goes through also comes with a recipe, which is like a script that tells you about production parameters, like temperature and whatever, uh, and different, different parameters that need to be set as this. So, um, so that tells you about different parameters for individual steps. So even, even those tables are pretty complicated. Um, as I said, don't worry about it. These will, uh, about the details, but uh, so your setup and your typical fab will have a large relational database which stores a lot of information about the fab, both about uh, the kinds of products that the fab makes and also about the state of the fab's tools. Now, this makes just arranging the production steps for the products of your fab a pretty complicated scheduling problem, but it gets uh, exacerbated by the fact that um, the schedule in the fab kind of go like this, is in that you might compute a very good schedule for your, for your chips and your fab, 
but um, your, your fab breaks down all the time. Tools go out of spec, they just break down outright, there might be maintenance going on, uh, things that you didn't account for in your schedule. And so you really, when you're building a schedule, you have to realize that when you put on a schedule for the fab to execute, it's no more than a recommendation. You hope that the fab is going to execute it, but you don't, actually you don't know what it's really actually going to do. Now, as if that wasn't bad enough, there's problems like queue time processing, something called queue time problem, which also exists in other fields, where because of the chemical processes that go on on your chip, uh, there might be subsequences of your route that if you enter them, you need to exit them within a certain amount of time. Otherwise, I don't actually know what happens, but I imagine mold accretes or something. Um, and so you really have to make a wise decision whether you're going to start the next production step, and you should be reasonably sure that you're going to make it out the other side of that queue time zone on time. And so, uh, so that's what we were looking at, primarily working with a company uh, in, in, in California called Starview that made a large um, sort of Java enterprise tool suit for doing real-time event processing. Um, and anyway, marketing, old marketing slide. Uh, and the idea was that you would hook up this platform um, to the, the stream of events coming out of the fab, you would make scheduling decisions, feed them back into the fab, um, and you would describe the actual scheduling by a programming language that's built into, or that was built into the star um, platform, called, um, uh, into the Starview platform, that programming language still exists called Star. Um, and it was kind of a little oddity in that it was, um, that Star is a JDM-based language that's, that's functional and that's multi-paradigm. Um, and it has a sophisticated type system that resembles that of Haskell. So if you know Haskell, you can imagine that Star is something like a strict version of Haskell that can handle the JDM. And the funny thing was that um, Starview at the time had no, uh, they had somebody who designed this wonderful Star programming language called Frank McKay, but they had zero functional programmers to actually make use of it, uh, including Frank McKay was not implemented all this in Java. Well, he's not, he's not himself a functional programmer. Um, and so by the time I joined, uh, Starview had already been at work on this project with traditional techniques. So they built a system called ELPS, um, that would, would run on this uh, Starview Enterprise platform and it would perform uh, simulation and scheduling for semiconductor fabs. But they had this problem in that the system was structured like this. Um, so here was the actual fab, and there's a large relational database that stores the entire current state of the fab, everything there is to know about the fab, hopefully. And then they had a computer that had a mirror of the, uh, of the fab state database. And then they had a bunch of agents, or you might say objects, that would be assigned to each lot. So a lot is just a box full of wafers uh, to each lot and each tool in the, in the fab. And, uh, and they would build what's called agent-based um, architecture in that, um, in that they would uh, assign what's called, they would assign agent software components uh, to each entity in the fab. So in particular, each machine would have an agent so it's like an agent in Hollywood, I suppose. Uh, and you would have an agent assigned to each lot, and each agent's job is to represent the interests of that entity. Right? So a lot really wants to be turned into a final box of, a, a box of finally produced uh, chips, and the machine wants to be busy all the time. Right? And the agent will try to make sure that that actually happens. Um, and, uh, and, and, and then they would have those agents would then look at the, at the mirror of the fab state in order to determine what was going on. Again, these are original slides. I'm, I'm not responsible for how bad they are. But, um, so, but it shows what happens in sort of real world traditional software design. So um, in particular, uh, because that fab state was represented as a large relational database, um, it, it would have been a complicated job to turn that into some sort of uh, object structure. So instead of, instead what the machine agent and the lot <laughs> agent would do is they would talk to the database to find out what was going on with their lot or their tool. Um, and you would already see, see that that creates a, a number of problems. First of all, you have this big blob of sheer mutable state uh, right in the middle of the system. And there was a lot of contention over that center, they call it cache. Uh, there was a lot of contention over access to that state because it changed all the time. Right? The fab would, would do something and then the internal state would change. Um, it just so happened that in their particular software architecture, the cache didn't have transactional integrity. And also, 
So I don't know what your experience with ORMs is or with relational databases, but relational databases are really a terrible tool for data modeling. Um, they're great for you know, warehousing your data and letting you execute um, queries on them, but, but um, uh, in this case, this is the only information that everybody has. And so what happens is that a coherent piece of information gets spread out across several tables, across several shards, and then you have to worry about the consistency of those shards as you access them. It's also really usually an honors way of, of accessing your data. Uh, and it, was, it just so happens that the people who build fab schedulers are not really <coughs> well-trained software developers, so they tend not to build very efficient database schemas for accessing that. And so the LCD system had a number of problems, uh, so it had these as problems, and that caused a number of symptoms in the, in the system itself. So the system barely could keep up with the actual fab. It was, like, it was almost impossible to test because Testing would involve, you would need a copy of that database, and testing would mutate that database. Uh, and so to get reproducible tests was very different, very difficult. And the software was so complicated that we would have like a bug a day and no sign that like the overall situation would be getting better, right? Um, and advanced scheduling algorithms are really hard to implement with this sort of uh, agent-based architecture. Um, uh, if, you, if you split your world into individual objects or whatever it is, you write Erlang processes, which is very nice in many applications, it's not so nice here because you want to make scheduling decisions that take into account your entire fab. You really want to be able to look around, see what's going on, and see, oh, you know, this thing that's going on here relates to that other thing that's going on there. And if the only way you have to talk about this is that you have agents, uh, you know, who call each other on the phone, um, and, and, and worse, they don't even know what's going on with their lot, so they have to call like the central authority on the phone to find, you know, what's going on with my lot? You know, oh, okay, I should talk to that other lot. It doesn't really work. Um, and nobody could figure out how to solve the queue time problem. And, and I invite you to think a little bit about well, how you might solve it. Um, we came to the conclusion that the only, or, or to this day, really, the only solution I know to the queue time problem is to simulate the fab. So the idea is, you have this decision to make that um, you, you, you might, you may or may not want to put a lot into a queue time zone. And you only want to put it in if you know that's going to make it out successfully. So one way to find out is just to simulate the fab and see if that lot's going to make it out successfully. And if it doesn't, you just wait a little while, hold it back, um, and then try again later. But there's this problem. How do you build a simulator as part of the running system when your entire state is in the relational data? So the system that we really wanted to build, it became very clear to me, was to build a purely functional system where you have the actual tab. You know, this very, I, think, I always feel this very important conceptual thing for purely functional programmers is then you have a representation of the state of the tab at a certain time that you, you know, that you somehow put in your computer. And then as, you know, as the actual tab sort of mutates its own state as it goes along on the computer, uh, you create new representations for the state of the fab at later times. Right? So you have one object represents um, the state of the fab at time x. You run the scheduler, you run the fab simulator a little bit, and then you have another object that represents the state of the fab at time x plus 1, then x plus 2, and so on. These are all separate, conceptually independent objects that you can access independently. Um, and if you have that, then it becomes really easy to do what kind of a redundant word, speculative simulation, but which is important in that context because it allows you to <coughs> simulate and then to throw away most of the results of that simulation. After all, you're only interested in whether your lot will make it out of the queue time zone successfully. You're not really interested in all that goes on in the tab uh, after you're done with it. And so, and also, um, if the representations of your fab state are at all independent, it's very easy to run these kinds of computations in parallel. In fact, it's totally trivial, which is uh, really awful if you have to do this, if all you have to work with is a relational you know, Oracle type uh, database where the fab state you know, takes up gigabytes. Right? Because how, how do you do this, right? You, you, you would have to take a, a copy of the database, which is not practical uh, you know, to do in a short, a short amount of time. So um, unfortunately, purely functional programming has really seen a major development, I think, in the last 10 years or so which is the development of really efficient, purely functional data structures, um, where it, it appears as though you're making you know, whatever, a new list from an old list, um, 
But two things happen. First of all, uh, this is made really efficient. So it's not like I mean, if you have, I'm sure you all know what I'm talking about, but if you like, take a Java collections list and you add elements um, to the end, that can potentially, that single addition can get pretty expensive because it might double the back of the array um, uh, or something like that. Um, on the other hand, um, and, and it mutates your data structure, right? It throws away the old version of your list in favor of a new version of the list. And in, in, in really functional programming, I can take a list and I can make a new list that extends the old list by another element and both lists are still around. And so it used to be the case that you only had these single, singly list, linked lists where um, you know, only certain operations were efficient, but nowadays we really have uh, functional data structures that are efficient over a wide range of operations and are really great for everyday use. Um, and they're based, uh, and they're all basically, uh, they're all essentially based on trees, sometimes pretty complicated tree structures like finger trees, uh, or sometimes just, just sort of 32 way trees uh, for representing sequences. Um, and so this has, this has two advantages. First of all, you get purely functional data structures that are capable of representing fab state in memory and manipulating it efficiently. And also, because you have tree, tree structures, if you, I mean, especially if you have sort of uh, slightly balanced tree structures, you can use these as the basis for parallel processing. Because many operations are really convenient to split, I mean, you really want to split your, I mean, many operations are shot such that you, it's, it's nice to just be able to split your list in the middle, and then do something on the left side, do something on the right side, combine the results, and your tree structures, um, uh, typical tree structures and use purely functional data structures will give you exactly that, which is very nice. And so, just doing that, just, um, just finding a reasonable representation of the fab state and using efficient, uh, efficient functional data structures represent and made it feasible to do that kind of simulation that I show and then solve the Q-time problem, which people have been banging their heads against for months. Um, I think the first, um, uh, the, the first solution I wrote for this took me, a, took me an afternoon to write. I'll get more, I'll get back more, I'll, I'll get back to that later. So, if we have time. Um, so that's one thing, right? It's purely functional programming, uh, gives you the disadvantages that you can do simulation without having to worry about mutating um, state uh, that you later want to throw away again. Uh, I think an even more important advantage is that we were able to talk to talk what I, about what I call compositional models. So for example, uh, I talked about cluster tools, you may remember, where you have several tools that combine into a large complex tool. Um, and, and so there's a principle there uh, involved. Right? So you, can, uh, you can view a tool as a component, and then you might combine several tools into a bigger tool by just exploiting, by both using the component interfaces and then exposing the component interface at the outside. Um, so it's really easy to sort of see it in the physical reality of tools, um, even though it's, it's more complicated than it seems on the outside to actually implement it. But um, I mean, one example is where, where it becomes more that, that, that kind of approach becomes more apparent is in the modeling of routes. Are you told to a route is essentially, well, if you start talking about it, it's just a sequence of descriptions of production steps that a wafer goes through. Okay. But then I told you about Q time zones, so sometimes you might have subsequences that are sort of, you know, there's a, there's a bracket around them uh, that you have to finish in a certain amount of time. And so, if you just do rigorous modeling of this in a functional language, you might end up with something like this, where you say, well, um, so a route is just a list of route elements. And each route element, so the simple case is route element, each route element is a single operation. Or a route element might be a queue time zone. Right? And the queue time zone is very important to say how long it lasts, how long do you have until you have to make it out again. And then you can think about, um, my there it is. and you can think about, well, what are you going to stick inside the queue time zone, right? You might think, well, I'm just going to stick a list of operations in there, but actually, it's a lot easier to just stick a route in there, a fully general route. And you see the difference. Um, so, okay, so a queue time zone is just a route nested inside a route with a duration. And then when you think about that, so and then you think, oh, I'm done. Um, but then you, after a while, you realize you might pick up the fab state while the lot is in the middle of the queue time zone. And that is not represented here. So that's why you need the code in blue, which says, well, uh, I need a route that's still left in the queue time zone. I need the route that comes after the queue time zone. And I need the target time 
when it needs to be finished. <coughs> and so this model that you're seeing here, that you're seeing here does, does I mean, it models two time zones and routes, but it does two more things. I mean, first of all, it allows you to, uh, uh, allows you to talk about being in the middle of a Q time zone. And if you look closely, you can see that because there's a drought inside the Q time zone, there might also be a Q time zone inside the route inside a Q time zone, so you might miss them. Which is, um, you know, everybody thought, oh, that's a nonsense idea, who's ever going to need it? But then we talked to semiconductor manufacturers, and they said, oh, yeah, we've been wanting this for a long time, we just haven't told anybody yet because we couldn't put it in the relation to the database. Okay? So um, it's, just, it's just a regular, rigorous system that you're modeling. And also it's compositional, right? In the sense that you can assemble smaller routes into larger routes by using that concept of, of Q time zones. And so we ended up looking for compositional models in many different aspects of the system. We ended up finding it in, in surprising places. Um, so in particular, we found it, well, we saw it, we found it in routes, we found it in equipment, which I showed you. Uh, we also found it in schedulers and scheduling policies and in a notion called hope that I want to talk about. Um, Maybe I should, so, um, well, I should probably complicate the original problem statement even more. Um, so here's, here's an additional problem, is if you run a chip through a tool to perform a certain production step, it might be the case, I mean, for example, if you do lithography, so you, you know, essentially you make a photo, uh, you, might make, you might need the correct photo negative called a reticle uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the tool. These reticles are very expensive, so there might only be a few around. So you're tracking your chip into your tool, and then preferably the reticle that you need will also be there. So what happens currently is you track it in, and then, some, then somebody goes looking for the reticle. Um, and, and, by, and during that time, of course, the tool is blocked, um, and you're, you're wasting precious time. So you need, uh, you need sort of general resources for that. But I told you the problem with trying to make the fab do certain things is that the fab might not do them. So um, uh, how, do you, how do you deal with this fact, right? You, so, so your lot is getting closer and closer to your tool. You, you somehow try to effect that the reticle also goes there, but the fact might just not do it. And somehow you need to track what goes on the path. And so I showed you that Beauty and the Beast, Beast picture earlier. Here's another image. Um, so it's sort of like the penalty kick, right? You, you, um, you know, a goalkeeper, this is, everybody know who this is, right? This is Hope Zolo, the goalkeeper of the American national football team. Uh, and, and, and so when you try to prevent a, a penalty kick from succeeding, you actually have to kick, I mean, the goalkeeper needs to pick a corner before the ball leaves the foot of the guy who perform, or, or, or woman who performs the penalty kick. So, uh, and that's kind of what we need to do, is we need to, uh, we need to guess what the foul is actually going to do in response to the instructions that we issue to it. So, and another way to talk about it is that you really, so when you jump in a certain corner or you make a, or you perform a certain action in the fab, you hope that the ball is actually going to go there and not the other corner. Right? And so that, that sort of analogy got us thinking about the, the notion of hope. So in the fab, we would hope that the fab would do it. In the fab, we would hope that the fab would actually do, uh, perform the instruction that the schedule would issue. And so we, we thought a while about what hope means in the fab, but then we realized we really should be talking about the very general notion of hope. You know? Sometimes you have this hope, you have no way of making this hope materializing or not. Right? Everybody who, knows, who has little children knows that they don't smile at inopportune times. Um, uh, sometimes you might be able to talk to people right, and give them instructions. Um, sorry, it's Microsoft code art. Um, <laughs> so, uh, you, might, you might give them instructions, right, in the hope that uh, these instructions will, uh, will actually be performed. Um, or uh, you might, in, in case, you know, you might, you might have something like this where you iterate hope. Um, I, this is so stupid, right? They have a male doctor only uh, in their clip art. Um, and sometimes hope doesn't materialize. It's it is, it is irretrievably shattered, right? And so we, we got, we, we, we thought about, you know, what, what is, what is this general notion of hope and what is a correct model to talk about it in software? And we came up with this little picture that says, well, hope, it may either, it sort of has a state, right? It, it may either be shattered, it may be fulfilled, and in, in which case your hope hopefully has delivered something, or um, you know, your hope as time progresses might be deferred and turned into another hope. Right? And underneath 
uh, underneath sort of the hope, uh, you might issue instructions that, that try to expedite your hope as it goes through the tab. Um, or, uh, but, but you really see that there's very little to tab specific about this notion. Um, so here's a style representation of this that I wrote down at some point. Uh, never mind the details, it's just, it's just code that represents this picture. Um, and uh, you know, then you think about, you, know, you, you might want to hope for specific events happening in the fab or a certain, uh, certain fab stage materialize. You might also think about a hope that you have for something to happen and then you uh, attach a deadline to it. Right? So you make a smaller hope as you make a bigger hope from a smaller hope. And you have hope where you commit instructions to whatever it is that you're dealing with. Um, and so these things, fab events, fab state, dispatch instructions, they are really what's specific about the fab. Right? They are your thorny, messy, real-world problem that runs underneath that general notion of hope. And I, um, so uh, I don't know if anybody read it. So there's, there's a, well, in the 80s, I think there was a movie called Ghostbusters 2, where a river of slime was running underneath New York City, where all kinds of things were happening that nobody wanted to know about, right? And uh, so, so that's what I call this stuff, right? It's, I, it's like the slime running underneath your pure notion of hope. Um, and of course, then somebody goes down there and, and grabs in there and rips out some of the slime and looks at it and, um, and tries to make a change to it. And so, um, so this notion is, is called monad. So I call it monad. So monad is something that will produce a result, and in the process of producing the result, it may reach into a river of slime that you don't usually see, right? And either put something in or pull something out. Um, and so, you know, you, you, may not, you may have noticed that hope, right, this, this fulfilled hope delivers a, a payload, right, and computer software means it delivers a value. Um, and so, so you really wanted something that does something and then delivers a value. And when you see that pattern in functional programming, uh, you should check whether you are not dealing with, whether you're dealing with something called a monad, which is a computation, deals a value, can deal with a reverse line. And of course, and what also what monads give you is they give you sequential composition in the sense that you might have a hope that says, well, at first I hope that this one thing's gonna happen, and when that thing has happened, I'm gonna hope for something else to happen, right? And that thing combined is also gonna be hope. Um, and so, um, really, you have this hope, and upon fulfillment, another hope happens. That just happens to correspond to, uh, uh, to a standard monadic operation combined. So, um, uh, and, and, and also the monad is really easy then to read about parallel composition, where you where you hope for a, uh, for, for, for a number of things to happen, um, uh, and, and, and they might, uh, and they're independent of one another, right? But your collective hope is only fulfilled when you know your three component hopes are fulfilled. Um, and so you can talk about com parallel composition. But the important thing is again that you take, you know, two hopes and you combine them into another hope. You don't combine, you don't take two hopes and combine them into a wish and you combine two wishes into something else, right? Which is the way that you know, a lot of software systems, especially software systems based on relational databases are, are structured, right? You really want that closure thing where you know, things combine into things, right? And not, not into things and bunks and whatever. Um, uh, so and that, that's all what we call compositionality. So, um, um, so, and then we got, so we, so, so that was, so, so that was what enabled us to think about hope, and it, it, it dramatically cut down the amount of code that we needed to uh, track the progress of radicals and things like that through the fab, um, and write, write like independent modular criteria that allow the, uh, the scheduler to, uh, to find out what's going on in the fab, even though the fab doesn't even give explicit feedback on, oh, I didn't do this thing that you asked me to do. Um, and so, so it, it, it dramatically simplified the code, and when all the types checked out, it actually did run correctly. It doesn't always happen, but in that case it did. Um, also, so the next, so once we've done that, we were thinking about, um, you know, customers in this, uh, in this field, they always want, they, I mean, they want to assemble their own individual scheduling policy. Uh, and preferably they'd like to do this by some kind of graphical interface where they have a bunch of boxes and arrows uh, that they can combine, which is, I always thought it was a stupid idea, but we thought about it for a while. What we did think about definitely was, well, how can we split scheduling into different areas of concern? Uh, so how can we make, you know, track is movement, which is sort of the basic bread and butter business of, of scheduling, how can we turn that 
into a software component that's separate from something that worries about maintenance or something that worries about queue time violation avoidance uh, or validation um, or things like that. Um, so, um, for example, it was not so difficult to build a scheduling component that would ensure progress. So if you look in a real fab, uh, sometimes people will tell you, oh, this lot's been, in, you know, it's been there for half a year, and that's because the scheduler, there was always something more important to do. Um, and so, so the scheduler would, would have always, you know, queue it in at the back, but of course, there's somewhere there's a customer who's waiting for that product that is never going to get shipped. Um, and so, um, so, but you can, you can then build a scheduling component that will make it ship if, if, if it can be made easily. Um, uh, so, um, and then really you want to worry, and, 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 and the way you want to parameterize that scheduler is essentially just by doing ordering of chips that are in front of the tool. So that's not so hard to do, but, um, what we wanted to do, well, for example, that queue time avoidance thing, right? When you heard me talk about it, I said, well, we're just going to simulate the fab and then hold bots back. I didn't, that doesn't say anything about the base scheduling strategy at all, right? I can tell you about it. And so it should be an independent software component. Um, and we kind of upped the ante a little bit by, well, I, so I thought, well, it's kind, of, it's, it's kind of stupid to throw away all this useful information from your simulation run for the queue time zone where, um, only sort of keep one bit, right? Did that did that lot make it up on time or not? Uh, there's useful information, in particular, the simulation can tell you in order for that lot to make it through the queue time zone successfully, right? That lot had that particular thing happen at a certain time, the next step certain had a certain other time, and so on. So this this sequence of production steps at certain times enabled the fab to avoid queue time violations. And so uh, it's useful. <coughs> To compare when the fab then actually processes that lot, it, it, it makes sense to compare compare the actual trajectory to the tra trajectory generated by simulation. And when it falls behind, you can instruct your base scheduler to speed it up a little bit so that things um, things are consistent with the original schedule that you generated. But what it really means is you, the interface between your base scheduler that is able to speed things up and your queue time zone avoidance scheduler component gets to be, well, it's not so clear what it should be. Right? You want a picture like this, where, uh, uh, where you have sort of the base of the progress schedule, and the queue time scheduler kind of wraps around that, right? It, 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 it intercepts certain scheduling instructions from the, from the basic scheduler and keeps lots back, but it also passes information to that internal scheduler. So if you look at this picture, you can kind of, well, if you squint at it from very far away, you can see that it's this thing, where things go out, things go in and things go out, come out. Right? Information goes into the scheduling component, things come out of the scheduling component, and something is going on inside. Right? So it doesn't, it isn't a monad. Right? Monads were these things where only things come out. Right? So fortunately, in functional programming, um, so here's, yeah, so it's, there's these things, right? They take input and output, and then uh, there's this thing. Unfortunately, in functional programming, we know this thing called an arrow that has this picture. Right? Something goes in, so uh, Professor Tiemann will forgive me uh, for greatly oversimplifying. But, um, so, but, but if you see this picture, right, you have something, some, something goes in, something comes out, and there's a river of slime which you can access uh, while it does that, then you might look uh, and check if it's, a, if it's an arrow, and these things turn out to be arrows. And so, um, so that turned out to, be, to work out really nicely. So it's like monads, it's a concept in category theory, and these days, you know, hardly a day passes without anybody discovering that some, uh, you know, hugely abstract concept from category theory has practical applications. And we were thrilled and delighted that uh, we were able to find these things. Um, and, and they work really well for uh, defining interfaces or scheduling components to talk to each other uh, and then make sure, and then the type system would ensure that the, if, as you constructed um, complicated scheduling policies that things would actually fit. I'm not going to bore you with the actual code here, but uh, a nice side effect of this model was that suddenly these, with these arrows, you can build representations that are graphical. And I, people who know me can attest to, I don't, I very, very, very rarely draw box and pointer di diagrams, but in this case, uh, you know, this is actually a viable option. You can draw this diagram and it translates directly into code, and so um, you can build like a graphical editor if, if that's something that you're, you're interested in. Um, and this will define sort of a cyclical system that will talk to itself uh, and that will, uh, that will implement a complex scheduling policy. 
So, um, so this was this so this was a process. So this was a project where we learned a lot of stuff. Um, um, and even though I've been doing functional programming since I think probably early or mid nineties, um, it, it was this project which happened with you know four that started four years ago, which really convinced me that it's worthwhile thinking about how to do software architecture based on purely functional programming. Um, so in particular, the purely functional programming allowed us to make state explicit in the system uh, and also make time explicit in the system. And uh, all these problems that we had previously with the agent-based system where everybody was accessing the same movable piece of state, uh, you know, there was contention, there was performance problems, and there was no way, I mean, think about, think about that setting, think about how you would solve the Q time problem. To this day, I don't know a solution. Um, um, and so, uh, but this is something that was really, really easy and almost trivial to do using purely functional programming once you set things up correctly. Um, also, um, uh, also we found out in this project that really, or I found out, I've learned in this project, that, that monads and arrows are eminently practical things to keep in your tool chest as you're writing uh, functional programs. So you don't, have, you don't have to have in-depth knowledge of category theory, but it, you just keep in mind there's these you know, things that yield a result and do something, uh, and then try to fit that into a monad will, will probably generate useful uh, information about how to structure your software. And, um, and for all this to work, um, I think that's something that the functional programming community ignored for too long. Only a few people were working on it for a long time. For all this to work in a practical setting, you need efficient functional data structures, and those we have not had for, too, for very long. That's uh, that's great stuff. That's it. Slurp in, uh, you know, a snapshot of the, of the current state, and then we'll progress from there. Okay. Right. And there's there's obviously a problem there, right? Because that takes a little while just to get that initial snapshot. Um, um, that I don't have a great answer to yet. So, uh, if I understand correctly, you run a multi-world simulation yeah. and choose the most fittest uh, fittest world of your results, and then uh, you put that into your business uh, process bank. Well, I mean, and we could do that very easily. Um, I mean, in that particular setting that I showed you, the Q time zone, it turned out to be sufficient, sufficient to just do a, a single trajectory. Right? Um, the, um, so, I mean, I mean, the beauty of this, right, I, I guess I can talk about that at all, but again, because of the in the 80s, we call it, you know, the scheduler and the simulator are re-entrant, right? Because obviously the simulator of the fab needs to, again, also have the scheduler inside, the simulator of the scheduler, if you will, right? And so that means things nest. Um, and, um, and, and, and so, so that, may, that, was very, that was very easy with this purely functional approach. So for, but, but so in, the, in the actual application, we were primarily interested in solving the Q-time problem. Where it just does, where it just turn out that doing a single trajectory happens to be sufficient for the cases that we looked at. Um, but the plan is, um, uh, the plan is, and so this, I mean, this, this project is in the past. Um, that we're working on a larger three project application with, um, with a number of industrial partners, and there one of the objectives is not just to use a simulator online as we do here, but also to do it offline to do an automatic optimization of your scheduler configuration. I think that's what you're talking about, is that you will have like a fitness function. And kind of genetic Yes, yeah, so we're considering, and it's, it's kind of slightly out of fashion, but this seems to be in some area where, where it might apply.
Now we have a coffee break, and the last session starts at quarter past four. <laughs>